This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Now a year ago, um, Alex and I sat in depot, which is just downstairs, and had one of the most educational lunches that I think I've ever had, in which we met with um, Kate Kennedy, who is a volcanologist uh, from Auckland University, and she, uh, she went through all the um, intricacies of volcanoes and fascinated us, fascinated both of us. Um, my son, however, is now petrified of volcanoes because I went home with such enthusiasm and explained to him that there were volcanoes all around us and that the, whilst it was slim, the possibility of one erupting in Auckland in the near future was still there. She's travelled the world studying volcanoes, uh, has been to many places, Sri Lanka, Hawaii, Apparently she almost got consumed by a lava flow in Hawaii. And uh, to talk to us about what lies beneath our feet and the pressure that's uh, building, I'd like to welcome uh, Kate Kennedy. Thank you. Okay. Now, first, can you hear me? All right, good. Uh, all right, thank you. Thanks to Nick and Alex, who I've met with a couple times over the last year. Uh, we named this the pressure under New Zealand because of the theme of the conference, of course. But I decided that what we're really talking about is that volcanoes are dangerous. And we're going to follow that theme through the talk today. Uh, we're going to talk about where volcanoes are and what they do and what volcanologists have to do to cope with the threat of volcanoes. So basics, uh, let's see, I guess, well, I guess I have to talk to this one, so sorry, I'll, I'll try to go back and forth, but there's, volcanoes are mostly on the edge of the tectonic plates, so we have these big plates that move around the surface of the earth, and where the plates meet is where we tend to get earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, and we'll, we'll look at ones in New Zealand, up in the Philippines, and in Indonesia. We're also going to talk about one Yellowstone, which is not on a plate boundary. Um, and then we have a little surprise for you as we move along. So different kinds of volcanoes. There are basically three types. We have all of them in New Zealand. Um, the main one that we all think of as volcanoes are these big, beautiful cones. Narahoe is an example. It featured in the Lord of the Rings as Mount Doom. Uh, Taupo is a big volcano. It's a very, very big volcano. This is one of the ones that um, is, causes catastrophic problems if they erupt. And then we have little small volcanoes, like we have in Auckland. And in Auckland, we have more than 50 of them. Um, here you are up at the, um, in the middle of the city here. The green and the pink are all um, volcanic centers, so where the stuff came out in the first place. The orange is all lava flows. So <laughs> volcanoes are part of our lives here. Um, if, as you're walking around Auckland, if you see little hills, and, and all the little hills, chances are it's a volcano. Um, the problem is that Auckland has more than a million and a half, about a million and a half people, and a significant part of the nation's population and economy is based here, and this is an active volcanic field. So we could get an eruption at any time, anywhere in this area. And that is something that civil defense is quite concerned about. So civil defense and Auckland Council work with volcanologists. We have plans in action, and um, surely we will all be evacuated in time if the occasion arises. Uh, Auckland volcanoes can do several, produce several different kinds of things. Um, we have what's called a base surge, which um, is an explosive eruption. That's what we would expect probably at the beginning of an eruption. Um, it makes a big hole in the ground and produces quite a bit of ash and also hot gases and rocks that move laterally out from where the volcano erupts. Um, we get fountaining which throws lava and up, into the, up into the sky and makes, a little, makes these little cones, and we get lava flows. 
So base surges are the things that we are worried about because base are they're by far the most dangerous. In general, you can just walk away from lava flows. You can avoid fountaining. Um, base surges are unpredictable and dangerous, very, very hot. Um, and unfortunately, on a serious note, the place that we have seen base surges in modern history most is the collapse of the World Trade Center, where because of the force of the explosion and the collapse of the buildings, you had this big cloud of dust and um, material f forced out along the ground. That's the kind of thing you would expect in, um, in an eruption here. So the problem, again, talking about the city, is we are, it's a pretty small city area-wise, the central area. Um, and base surge has been found, we have found base surge deposits three kilometers away from where they came out. So if you put three kilometer, a three kilometer ring on sort of more or less the center of Auckland here, so here's, um, I can't see it very well. Here's the three kilometer ring here away from the center. Here's a five kilometer ring just to be safe. So we would certainly evacuate five kilometers if we knew a volcano was popping up somewhere. And that affects these suburbs. It affects the major highways that run through the city. It affects um, hospitals, medical centers, and about at least a half a million people. And these are old numbers, so actually the numbers are bigger <laughs> since then. So this is a, it's a very serious problem. And again, to emphasize, we don't know where the next volcano will come up. It's a real problem in Auckland. So um, hopefully we get at least a week or two warning. We can deal with that and get people out of where they need to be gotten out of. Another place where you actually have the potential for active volcanism that's unexpected, most people don't know about it, is in Australia. So here's Melbourne. You have hundreds of volcanoes west of Melbourne. It's a big volcanic field. Um, the most recent eruption was 5,000 years ago around, I don't know how to pronounce it, how do people pronounce it? Mount Gambier, Mount Gambier, don't know. Um, here's a quote only a volcanologist could say. The most recent eruption was 5,000 years ago. The newer volcanics, that's the area, newer volcanics is considered an active province. And the positive side is that we may yet provide Australia with more eruptions, adding to the glorious volcanic features of the wonderful landscape. <laughs> that's after the panic subsides. Um, that's a volcanologist at Monash, which is in Melbourne. So we're gonna move on to slightly bigger volcanoes now. Um, these are the cones, the stratocones. They're the most serious problem we have on the Earth because there are, these are the ones that ring the Pacific Rim, the ring of fire. Um, they get to be pretty big. They erupt consistently, um, more or less in the same place over thousands of years. So they build these big cones. Um, in this case, you had um, a volcano become active. It was actually a very small eruption, or pretty small eruption, but the volcano was covered with snow. So the heat from the eruption melted the snow, the ash and the snow mixed together and caused what's called a lahar or a mud flow, which came down as a river from the side of the volcano, completely inundate, inundated an entire city and killed 23,000 people out of not that many. I mean, a few thousand people survived. So this was, um, this was a real, I mean, it was staggering. and People couldn't believe that it had happened. And the worst part of it was that volcanologists had been telling the government that this was a problem, that this could be a problem. And they were completely ignored. There was no evacuation plan. Nothing was done at all. So the volcano erupted and everybody just sort of sat there. Um, the, the good news is that Colombia had, was obviously <laughs> quite shocked. The whole world was shocked. And um, now um, a lot of countries take lahars, mud flows, much more seriously than they used to because of this. Um, where we've had a success story of volcanologists and government or civil defense working together 
is in Pinatubo in the Philippines. Um, it was a beautiful cone volcano. Um, 700 people died, which was a pretty small number considering that a million people lived around this volcano when it became active. And it had a huge eruption. This is the second biggest eruption in the 20th century. Um, and it's because the, the volcanology group, the Filipino government, the US Geological Survey acknowledged the problem, worked together, had very intensive monitoring, and evacuated more than 70,000 people. So everyone within a, whatever it was, I don't know, so 10, 20 kilometer radius or something around the volcano got evacuated. And in the end, it was quite impressive. I mean, this is daytime, right? And it is a tropical area. This is not snow. This is ash. Um, planes were grounded. People were evacuated. Um, but it was, it was, on the grand scheme of things, wildly successful because there was this partnership and um, between, you know, when do we evacuate, when, and, and also, I should say, the volcanologists were unbelievably lucky because they decided now it's going to erupt, recommended evacuation, the people made the decision to evacuate, and the volcano erupted. And sometimes that doesn't go very well. Sometimes it's months before the volcano erupts, and, and we lose a lot of credibility. People go back in, then they get killed. It doesn't go well. So um, there is definitely luck involved in this as well. Um, here's our most famous volcano, I think, the volcanic eruption that everyone has probably heard of, um, Pompeii. It was an eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79. It is uh, portrayed in the media as a volcano, lots of bombs, big romance. Um, I haven't actually seen the movie. I probably should. Um, and unfortunately, what really happened is these things called pyroclastic flows hurtling down the side of the mountain, um, very hot. So this is the stratovolcano equivalent of a base surge. Very hot gas, ash, rocks, all mixed in together. Um, they can be, they can move a couple hundred kilometers per hour. They can be three, 400 degrees Celsius. Um, the, the, there are two towns, I actually should have put Herculaneum up here as well because there were two towns that are famous as a result of this eruption. And Herculaneum got the full blast of the pyroclastic flow so people were incinerated instantly, like nothing left except bones. Um, but also no pain, whereas the people of Pompeii probably really suffered because they got um, showered with ash and suffocated. So it was probably a very long, well, relatively drawn out, painful way to go. Um, some of the ash is hot. This is a, the dog is um, seizing because if you, <laughs> in a gruesome thing that some of us volcanologists do or medical, you know, people who are interested in how volcanoes affect the human body, um, you can study how, you know, if you're X amount of temperature, this is what happens to your body. And if you are, you know, I forget what it is, a couple hundred degrees C, your joints seize up and you start to convulse. And so that's what has happened to this poor dog. Um, we have, sorry, so the modern Vesuvius, so that was, you know, a couple thousand years ago. Modern Vesuvius is here. It's, you can see this green volcano surrounded by millions of people. And um, you can see here how crowded it is. The conditions are not ideal for evacuation. So it um, could take weeks. They have a very alert observatory. And, um, and but we have, we have acknowledgement. Europe's ticking time bomb. I'll read this. The Stevius is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world but scientists and the civil authorities can't agree on how to prepare for a future eruption, which incidentally could happen at any time. I mean, Vesuvius is considered um, active, I mean, not imminently, but it could happen at any time. So um, Naples, if you go there, don't spend very long, is my recommendation. <laughs> That's sort of how I feel about Wellington, though, so <laughs> I'm maybe not, not <laughs> very objective. <laughs> um, 
uh, bigger, so moving up the scale of size of volcanoes, Tambora in Indonesia, April 1815. Um, the, the ash, it was quite a big eruption. The ash, uh, it caused tsunamis. It dumped ash. It had pyroclastic flows. Um, probably, I don't know, ten, definitely tens of thousands of people were killed in the original eruption. Um, but the biggest impact was ash thrown up into the stratosphere, so more than 25 kilometers high, that gets picked up by winds circulating the globe and lowered global temperatures at least one degree, probably more than one degree. You may have heard of this, 1816, the year without a summer. And the, it, it, it had a huge impact on northern, well, North America, Europe, China, um, you can see it happened. So it happened right in the spring of northern, northern spring. Um, basically, crops didn't grow. So you had a whole summer of um, storms, rain, cold temperatures, darkness. Uh, Mary Shelley composed, wrote the book of Frankenstein. She and her friends got together and told ghost stories. Lord Byron wrote this big poem about the apocalypse. Um, and when that happens, the, the reason, I should have said this, the reason the temperatures are lowered is because what comes out of, of volcanoes is sulfur-laden gases, so gases with a lot of sulfur in them. And when sulfur gets into the highest levels of the atmosphere, it actually deflects sunlight, so that was part of the problem with the temperatures. Um, and it lasts there for a long time. So you had sunsets, you have these crazy colored sunsets captured in art um, for years afterwards. Uh, and this is a pretty big eruption, Tambora. But next, we're gonna go to the really big eruptions, the super volcanoes. So Yellowstone is in the middle of the US, well, northwest in the US. This um, brown shape shows the bigger, biggest eruptions of Yellowstone have dumped ash over, you know, what is that, half to two-thirds of the United States. That's a very big area. Um, Topo is about the same. Um, it covered most of the North Island with 200 meters of ash and rocks. And that stuff, when it, it goes down hot, and when it sits, it cements done. You can't move it. So, and it made a very big hole. I mean, this is the North Island, so it's now a lake. It's, but it's still also considered active. Um, so volcanoes, this is relative volumes of what's been erupted. These two really big volumes, so imagine a sphere, you know, imagine a magma chamber. Um, that's representative of volumes that's been erupted from the Yellowstone and the Topo volcanoes. Um, this little tiny dot here is Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980. Um, it's, it is bigger than the eruption of Ruapehu in 95-96, which you know, had actually a significant economic impact on New Zealand, closed the airport, that kind of thing. So what we're used to is actually pretty small eruptions. Um, the eruption that, remember, we just talked about in the Tambora eruption in Indonesia in 1816, um, is this circle here. So it's big, it's, it's big, but it's not this big. So it's, you know, this is tens of times bigger than those. So what do we do? We, um, you know, I've been saying how we have to work, we have to prepare, we have to do these things. What do we do if we have one of these super eruptions? We're kind of, we don't actually, honestly, because there's just a <laughs> You know, it's a global catastrophe to sort of an unspeakable level. Um, had, having said that, we do monitor them. And um, I'm going to talk now just a little bit about monitoring, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we do have lots of instruments set up around Taupo and Yellowstone. So we'll get warning that something catastrophic is going to happen. I don't know. If that's Maybe we don't want to know, really. Um, what do we do? We watch the volcano. Is activity increasing? This is White Island in, um, off the east coast of New Zealand. Um, and you, you literally do. You, have, you set up webcams around your volcano and you watch it. Um, whoa, whoa. 
Okay. Um, we look for deformation of the volcano. So use, we use lasers, GPS technology, to actually watch the shape of the volcano. And this is on a like centimeter, millimeter to centimeter scale. Um, is the magma coming up under the volcano? And when it does, it has to make, it, it needs space. So it actually pushes the size of the volcano out. Um, you can see, so Mount St. Helens was particularly famous, 1980. The, it started off with a beautiful big cone like this, and then ended up with this bulge sticking off the edge. And um, in the end, it, it was very bad because the eruption went sideways, which was unexpected. So now we spend quite a lot of effort monitoring the deformation of the shape of the volcanoes. Um, we smell them. We do a chemical analysis of, their, of the fluids. We look at gas. We look at um, liquids, so like a lake. If there's a volcanic lake, we test that. Um, and sulfur gases and carbon dioxide tend to go up when magma is approaching the surface or getting closer. Uh, we listen to the volcano. So one of the main ways that we see magma moving in the ground is through seismic activity because it makes earthquakes. It's pushing, it's liquid rock pushing the solid rocks away. Um, this is Pinatubo where they, in a very big hurry, installed a whole bunch of seismometers on the surface. Um, ideally, if you have more time to prepare, you put a seism this is the seismometer here, you put it down into a very deep hole where it's protected from noise, and so you get better signals. Um, this is a size, um, seismogram. This is from Tongariro in 2012. We had a little tiny eruption. Um, and this is, so this is one day. This is 24 hours of time. And you can see, so normally it was, it was pretty quiet, kind of just a little jittery activity. Every now and then there was a tiny, tiny eruption, uh, sorry, tiny earthquake. And then here's where you have your eruption here, where suddenly things get a little peppy. Ideally, you see um, earthquake activity increasing gradually so that you can actually get a sense that things are getting worse, you know, that, that the magma is moving more and more. Um, this is a big problem, that reading these things, the gas, the um, deformation, this is what makes being a volcanologist hard, an active volcanologist working in a volcano observatory, is reading these signals is um, not obvious. It is not, you don't know what the volcano is going to do. And so people are just doing their best. Um, unfortunately, you, <laughs> you have the previous experience to learn from, and that's how the science builds up. Um, listening to the volcano, what else might be here? So we're almost done here. Um, we installed a whole bunch of seismometers around Auckland because Auckland is an active volcanic field. We're concerned when the magma starts coming up, we want to know right away. So one of those seismometers is under Eden Park. And in 2011, we recorded a seismogram of the activity in Eden Park during the World Cup final. This is, of course, just about the same time now. And we actually recorded. So here's the start of the game. Here's the first, the New Zealand try. And then it got really <laughs> tense. People were not doing very much. They were not, you know, look, even ears halftime. There was no cheering. There was no, everyone was really, I mean, I wasn't there. I was in my, in a living room with my friend who was hiding behind the sofa because she couldn't bear it. Um, and then at the end, there's lots of cheering, jumping, and this is what it looks like when 60,000 people erupt all at the same time. So that's all I'll say about that. But there's your, there's an image to carry with you through the weekend. And that's all. I'll be in the speaker's room later if people want to ask questions or talk about volcanoes. Thanks for having me. Thank you.